All right, well, good morning, ladies. It's so good to be here. I love this group of women. I just haven't been here in months and months, and I just walk in here, and I see so many familiar faces and friends and people I consider family, and it's just good to be here with you all this morning in this spring session as we look at some of these practices that draw us closer to God and deepen our love for him and our understanding of him. And I'm looking at this group right here and I'm really wishing I would have worn my brown Carhartt hat this morning because my hair was not cooperating and I would have just fit right in. Drat. Next time, next time. All right, well, yes, as Janelle said, today we are talking about Sabbath rest and I know you all haven't gone there quite yet in the book, Um, so it's kind of fun that I get to teach you about it before you go there, and then you get to compare, you know, what we're learning this morning to what you're going to read. Now, the book is a lot more practical. It gives so much wisdom and great ideas on how to observe a Sabbath and what a Sabbath is, and um, the author kind of talks about his experience, you know, with kind of burning out and then learning how to Sabbath, and so I'm excited for you guys to read that. It's going to be great for you, but today, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a deep dive into the Sabbath. We're going to look at historically, biblically, what it meant, why God, you know, I I mean, there's so much to it, you guys, and we're only going to scratch the surface this morning. There is so much to this concept and this idea of Sabbath rest, and it's, it's beautiful. And so we get to go there together this morning. Um, we're going to be digging into the Word of God. This Word has authority. It has power. It gives life. It says it divides joint and marrow. And I believe this morning that this Word is going to move in power, not my own, and that this Word is going to bring illumination to our hearts and our minds. Amen? All right, so we're going to look at the origins of the Sabbath, how it was practiced, what Jesus said about the Sabbath, and how the work of the cross impacts how we observe the Sabbath today. So what it is, according to scripture, let's start there. We see it very first, the very first um, idea of the Sabbath is not mentioned with the word Sabbath, but in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles if you have that, otherwise I think I have a slide for that. Um, We see, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, and by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done." So we're going to make a couple of notes of a couple of things here. First of all, I want to point out um, that he, he blessed the, the, the day and made it holy because he ceased to work. Because the work was completed and finished and he rested. And it says, and he called that day holy because he rested. So the work did not make the day holy, but God called it holy because of the rest that was happening on that day, the ceasing of work. So this is actually what it means to Sabbath. The word Sabbath means to cease or to stop working. It's really simple. It's really straightforward. Um, But we're going to see this really simple, straightforward concept basically just mushroom as we we go through scripture and as we look at the different instances of of Sabbath um, throughout the rest of the day. So God ordains this pattern of living, of six days of work and then a day of rest. And, and, and it's just, it's what he did, right? And so every time we see God doing something, we want to make a note of it. Because we're called to, to bear his image, we're called to be like him. And so, so in Genesis, we see this, oh, this pattern, work and rest. And then if we jump ahead to Exodus, Leviticus, we're going to actually see this pattern become a part of the Mosaic law. So this pattern of work and rest, as we see in scripture, is instituted as a practice through the Mosaic law. So this concept of the Sabbath, it was a concept, this was something that we saw in scripture, is built into the design of creation. It's then given as a command to the people of God. And so we see, again, this beautiful pattern, and we're going to see this over and over again in scripture. It's not just with the Sabbath. We see 
a trait of who God is, a characteristic of who are, of how he operates. And it's, it's something that then is given to us is to walk this way, do this thing. And this beautiful pattern in scripture is we learn from our God in the, in the way that he operates in creation and in the world. So the fourth command is to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It was given to Moses as he was, you know, getting the Ten Commandments. And then we see um, that, well, here, sorry, I'm going to not read that verse quite yet. Um, I used to think that the Sabbath was only mentioned a few times in Scripture, right? Like in the Ten Commandments, and then I think maybe Jesus talked about it once or twice. And then I actually started reading about it and doing some study of my own. And I realized that this thing that started as a pattern in creation and then is given to the people of Israel as a part of the Mosaic law is so deeply woven into the fabric of scripture. You can, I mean, you can see it. It's, you, if you even just do a quick search in your little Bible app for the word rest or the word Sabbath, you're gonna see so many scriptures pertaining to this idea. And we're gonna see today um, how deeply it didn't just impact um, us, obviously, but how it impacted the people of Israel as they were called to live out this idea of Sabbath rest. So Deuteronomy 5.12, here's, here's a part of the law that's given to them. God says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord God commanded you. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God on which you must not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your manservant, your maidservant, nor your ox or donkey or any of your livestock, nor the foreigner within your gates so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. So all works except acts of mercy, acts of necessity, and acts of worship were forbidden. And we were, we're going to talk about it a little bit more, what specifically that looked like. Um, but Exodus 31, 13 then goes on to say, well, goes on to say, so that's kind of like an idea of what it is. He says to this, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. And so we see two purposes of Sabbath revealed to us in the scripture, to rest and to remind, all right? We are gonna rest physically, we're gonna rest spiritually, we're gonna rest our, our, you know, our hearts and our minds, but we're, there's a second key word there is we're gonna be reminded, we're gonna be reminded of who our God is because he says right here, so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. So scripture uses the word meditate, all right? That word has kind of been taken over by, you know, different groups and stuff, but we see our call in scripture is to meditate on who God is, meditate on his words, and that is a a huge part of our Sabbaths. So Sabbath was a time to stop working and sit back and watch creation continue to ebb and flow and watch the sun continue to rise and set and be reminded that we did not begin this world and we will not end this world. That our efforts did not contribute in any way to creation. Our efforts did not contribute in any way to the sun rising or to the sun setting. And it's a very humbling place to be when you can step back from something and take your hands off of it and it still keeps working, right? Have you ever done that in your job or in an area of ministry or something? Even when you leave the house with your husband there with the kids and they like you come back and they're all still alive and happy and functioning and you're like, oh, what am I even here for? But this is, this is a part of our Sabbath is that we, we step back and I wrote it this way, um, that we are reminded that we are not the ones who sustain creation and the earth. And so we are reminded as we Sabbath, we're reminded as we rest, we're reminded as we meditate on the works of God that we are not the ones who sustain our lives, we are not the ones who sustain the lives of those around us, we are not the ones who sustain the flow of creation in the world, that that place alone belongs to God. So that's part one of what we're reminded of. And then this leads us to a deeper reminder that God rules over us all. Because when we have this revelation that, oh wow, I don't really sustain 
life. I don't sustain the sun rising and the sun setting. I have no control over that, in fact. We're reminded um, that, that God is the ruler of everything. And so the people of Israel, as they're called to observe the Sabbath, um, they, what, what this does is it marks them. It marks them as a peculiar people because this was not heard of to one day a week cease everything, cease every effort, cease every gathering of food. I think I wrote a few of these things down here. Yeah, they, they cease their gathering of food, the building of fires. They could only walk a certain distance or carry a certain weight, right? Things of necessity were allowed, but basically anything beyond that was not allowed. And so this, this, was, this was practiced very rigidly. Um, we're going to see in scripture even warnings of what happens when you break the Sabbath and they're stern and they're harsh. But this is because God was communicating a truth to the people of Israel through the practice of the Sabbath. Because this is who our God is. He doesn't ask us to perform these mindless, empty tasks just to see if we'll jump through the hoops. That's not who our God is. What he is asking of us and what he requires of us, there is a truth and a purpose behind it. And we see this with the Sabbath. That it was a day that was fully set aside to recognize and worship the sustaining power of God and the provisional work of God. It was a reminder to the people of Israel that they were a holy people serving a holy God. And so here's what happened when they obeyed the Sabbath and when they submitted to the command that they were given to, to recognize and follow the Sabbath. They, they were blessed. They flourished. Isaiah 58, 13 says this, If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob. So we see this promise with the Sabbath. If they follow it, if they obey it, if they do it the way that he's called them to, they're gonna have favor in the land. They're gonna find their delight in the Lord and God's going to be with them and cause them to flourish and grow as a people and as a nation. So observing the Sabbath was an invitation into the rest and the presence of God. It was for our good that he created the Sabbath. It was for their good and for our good. Now, that's what happened when they would follow the Sabbath. How many people in here think that they would actually do that on a consistent basis with what we know about the people of Israel? They would follow it and then they would fall away. And so here's what happened when they would um, stop following the Sabbath. They would do one of two things. They would either stop observing it and they wouldn't, you know, they would, they would do whatever they wanted on the Sabbath day or they would observe the Sabbath day and they would, they would, they would go through the motions of it but their hearts were not connected to the truth that God was trying to bring them to as they were doing it. And there's this really crazy warning that we see in Isaiah 113. This was when they were, they were following the Sabbath. They were doing what you know, they were asked to do, um, but they were, not, they were not engaging with the truth of who God was. Their hearts were far from God. Their motives weren't pure. And God said this to them. He said, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. And so what, what God is basically saying is stop doing this out of an empty heart that is far from me. Right? His heart isn't that they would stop doing it all together and just throw the baby out with the bathwater. But his heart was... You, you don't even understand what I'm asking, why I'm asking you to do this. I'm, I'm inviting you into my rest and into my promise, and you're just going through the motions of observing a Sabbath, and this is such a great challenge and warning for us as we, as we look at these practices that we can do, these things that we can do to move ourselves closer to God and to love him more, is to check our hearts and make sure that as we're doing these things, are we doing them under the banner of truth 
and, and do we understand why we're doing it? And that's why I wanted to do a deep dive into the Sabbath day because I believe we do need to, to, to have Sabbath days and Sabbath moments in our life. But I don't want us to practice the Sabbath out of a heart that doesn't understand it or doesn't really care about the truth that God is calling us and inviting us into. So that's kind of why we're going down this path um, today. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right, we've been, we were just in the Old Testament kind of looking at the Israelites and what God had called them to. Um, between those two time periods, the religious leaders expanded the requirements and details of observing the Sabbath, if you can believe that. Because if you go to Leviticus and you actually read what was required of them, the fact that they could even expand on it already is, is crazy. But they went down to the gram of weight that you were allowed to carry on the Sabbath day. They went down to like the meters that you were allowed to walk. And how, how, like how could you get to this place, to this place? They, they put this burden and this weight on the Sabbath that did not belong there. So they added to this day their own efforts. Right? This was a day that was intended to be a day that they stopped work, that they recognized God, who he was, um, and, and they decided that they were going to make it harder on themselves. <laughs> How many times do we do that? How many times do you think, God, I'm going to do this thing for you. I'm, gonna, I'm excited to, to whatever it might be. And instead of finding our delight in God and who he is, we try to work and earn his approval. We're gonna, we're gonna get there a little bit, but that was just a little bunny trail. So um, one thing I did wanna talk about is Adam and I were in Israel about four, four years ago. Yeah, it was before COVID, so probably four years ago. Um, and we, were, we happened to be there over a Saturday, which is the day that they observe the Sabbath, right? We observe the Sabbath on a Sunday because we, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. That's like a sign of new creation, but they don't believe that Jesus was the son of God. So they, they've kept their Sabbath on a Saturday. And it was crazy because, you know, we'd been going around and touring and doing all, all the things that you do when you're in Israel. And then on Saturday, you know, we, we, we were in this hotel and there was just food everywhere all the time. Like they had just people making all different cuisines and types of food because there's people from all over the world who come to visit Israel. And so, you know, we had been really spoiled and just, you know, loving our life while we were there. And then you get up on the morning of the Sabbath and there's just like leftover cold food, just like piled in the buffet because they, they observed the Sabbath. They weren't going to cook for us on that day. And then the one thing that I will never forget is standing at the elevator, waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm like, what is taking so stinking long for this elevator? Well, on the Sabbath, they, they set their elevators to a Sabbath setting the night before, and it goes up and it opens at every floor and shuts every floor. So they don't have to push a button to get to their desired floor on the Sabbath day. And so these are some of the things that men have added to this idea, that people have, have poured on, right? This, this thing that God intended for our good, for our rest, for our delight in him has turned into such a harsh and heavy law. And so by the time Jesus came to earth, we see so much focus on the physical observance of the Sabbath that it had become a burden and a weight instead of a place of peace and rest and joy. And so Matthew 12 is a really good illustration of this. Jesus is walking with his disciples through a field on the Sabbath day. One of his disciples takes a handful of wheat to, you know, to pop in his mouth and eat, which I know that's not something we would do today, but that was something you know, that they did commonplace back then. Um, and so here we go. At the time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, his disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And then Jesus comes back with this response and he says, um, haven't you heard what David did when his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread. Or haven't you read in the law that the Sabbath... On the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent. I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. I love that, that statement that Jesus made to them, right? Because 
all they, when the temple represented everything to them. It was, it was all of their rituals, all of their laws, all of their rules bound into one thing. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, I'm, I'm greater than that. And in fact, something that's very cool is if, we, if you were to do more study on this, the temple is tied to the Sabbath, like the building of the temple, the tearing down of the temple, all of that is tied to Sabbath days and Sabbath years, which is incredible. But um, he, he says this, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So the Son of God, who was present at creation, the Son of God, who created the flow of six days of work and one day of rest, who created the idea of the Sabbath, is being scolded by people he created for quote-unquote breaking the Sabbath. And I, this, this statement later on in this passage, Jesus had he, gone on to heal someone on the Sabbath day. Um, and it says, So he stretched out his hand, who was completely restored, just as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. And I, I want us to just take a warning as we read about this this response to Jesus in the Sabbath. I want us to just hear in this scripture, we see these men who could not get over their own idea of what it had to look like and how it had to be done. All right? We are in a new season because of the work of the cross and we're gonna get there, but let the spirit of God lead you and speak to you all right, what is that going to look like for you? What is Sabbath rest going to look like for you? All right, moving on. So Sabbath rest is one of the things that Jesus restored and redeemed through the work of the cross. So he has these interactions with, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and they continually are looking for a way to kill him because of the way that he's handling the Sabbath. We know he goes to the cross he experiences death, he, he rises again from the dead, and from that moment on, we know everything related to the way that we look at, the way that we relate to God, the way that he relates to us, changes. Because now we are in Christ. Now, because of Jesus, when, when God looks at us, he sees his perfect son. So two important things, re, well, re, regarding the Sabbath of being in Christ is number one, we can experience the presence of God at any moment. His spirit lives in us, he dwells in us when we are in Christ. And so, so now we don't just have to go to a temple one day a week to experience the Sabbath rest, to experience the truth of God. We can, we can access his presence, we can access his word, we can enter into the Sabbath rest of Jesus at any moment moment of any day. And so the work of the cross changed the way that the Sabbath looks for us. The Sabbath is a promise that we're invited into. It's a practice for eternity in God's presence. And in our practice of the Sabbath, it's different now because our position is different now. We are in Christ and what's his is ours. Matthew 12, or I'm sorry, Matthew 11, 28 through 29 says this. This is Jesus talking. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the invitation of us entering into the rest of God because of Jesus and because of the work of the cross. We get to experience Sabbath rest in an entirely new, in a different way than the people of Israel ever could have imagined. Imagine if they could see what we have access to now. Imagine if they could see the work of the cross and what that bought for us and the freedom that it bought for us and the newness of life it bought for us. Scripture has always made it clear that our true and only rest is in the Lord. It's only found in Jesus. It is not found in our striving. 
It's not even found in our times of restfulness and our periods where we can sit down and rest and just do something that, you know, that is enjoyable to us. Unless that is paired with the truth of Jesus and who he is, unless we are living from his life, those restful, quiet moments are gonna be fleeting. And we're gonna be longing for more and craving more and craving something different. But when we find our rest in Christ alone, that is something that will endure in our hearts. In Hebrews 4, we read about um, Jesus, well, I'll just flip there. Um, Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because, I'm sorry, I'm losing my place, was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest. So the rest of God is entered into by faith, and that faith is in the finished work of the cross. We can only enter in to the rest of God when our faith is in the completed work of the cross and what Jesus has done for us. This is the rest, and this is what God reminds us of as we, as we look at the Sabbath and as we study this and as we ask ourselves, how can I participate in this? What does this look like for me? The Sabbath points to Jesus and the promise that one day he will restore all of creation to its original design and rhythm. And as followers of Jesus, when we observe the Sabbath, we enter into this already but not yet factor of the kingdom of God. When we stop working intentionally, we, we do, we, when we do this, what we're showing God is, is these three things. God, I trust you to give me the pro- productivity I need in the allotted time I need to work. I'm going to choose to abide in your presence, to rest and refresh my soul, and I'm going to ask you to highlight any areas of my life where my work and my striving have taken a higher priority than you. Because truly, a Sabbath is is like a tiny little fast from, from the things that might give us our identity, from the things that might think that we give us value, right? Like I, I do my work and this, and this it, it, it's what I do, it's who I am. And as we step back from that in, in a Sabbath place of rest, we allow the spirit of God to speak to us and remind us, no, no, we are not the ones who created the sun to rise and the sun to set. We are not the ones who, who you know, finished the work, began the work of the cross and finished the work of the cross. That alone belongs to God. And I think, at least for myself, I'm good at physically resting. I'm good at setting time aside to go for a walk in the woods or go for a run or spend some time alone in the car driving. Um, But the question is, can we rest in a way that engages our hearts and our minds in the Sabbath truth that God is the one who begins the work and completes the work? Scripture says it this way, he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Because we are still called to that period of work, right? Even, even through the, the work of the cross, he completed, he completed what he needed to do. We are still called to live righteous lives. We're still called to live, live in lives of, of seeking holiness. Um, we're still called into obedience. But we're not working to earn something. When we are living from the rest of God, I'm not, I'm not doing those things to earn my salvation or to earn God's favor or to earn his approval. I'm living from the rest of God and I'm, I'm doing those things because I love him, because I want to serve him. I want him to use my life. It's out of an abundance of knowing who I am, knowing who he is, and then I can rest in that truth while I seek to be obedient and righteous and pure. Does that make sense? All right. The work is done under the banner of the completed work of the cross. All of our work, all of our effort, when it is done under the banner of the completed work of the cross, we won't let it give us identity. We won't let it run us and own us and and drive us into the ground. When 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 we know who we are in Christ, and when we allow the completed work of the cross to be the banner over everything that we do, 
We live in the Sabbath rest of who God is, and all of our efforts are out of that truth. We enter into rest by faith. Hebrews 4 makes that really clear. And our faith is in a finished work, is in the the only one who can finish the work. I've been in kind of a season of Sabbath myself um, about seven months ago. I felt the Lord leading me to take kind of a step back from teaching, take a step back from leadership and women's and just kind of focus on my family and focus on some things he had called me to. And that was so hard for me and so good for me because what that did is it, is it highlighted some areas of my heart and my mind that just weren't healthy, right? That I was operating and I could do the things that he'd asked me to do, but it, it was like, I, hey, I was doing something for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motives. I had, I had this, this track that I thought I was gonna be on and do this thing and, and God just kind of slowly reeled me back and he said, Emily, the sun does not rise or set on you. You did not begin this work. You will not complete it. That is not your job. Your job is to live a life of obedience, to chase after righteousness, to know who I am and who I've called you to be. And I am at a place now where I don't want to serve or exist or be a mom or a wife out of anything else except that truth. Because I will drive myself into the ground. But when I allowed him to kind of wind me back, pull me back from these things, give me a new perspective, I got to take a deep breath and start to enjoy the rest of God that can only come from knowing that I am in Christ and he is in me. And guess what? The entire world is going to keep going on around us. But until we can live from that place, we are going to be weary souls. We are going to be tired but when we, can, when we can find ourselves in the work of the cross and say, God, you started this work. You're going to complete it. I'm going to do my best. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard while I can and how I can. But I'm going to pull, be pulled into seasons of rest where you remind me that, that it is by your power, it is by your strength, it has nothing to do with me or my talents or any of this. That is, that is our sweet spot of Sabbath rest. And I want, I want to encourage us today and ask us a couple of questions. These are questions I've had to answer um, for myself over the last few months. What are you doing in your own strength? What are you doing in your own strength? You, you realize you can be doing something that God has called you to, he's put your hand to, you can still be doing it in your own strength. And and Sabbath rest winds us back from that and and causes us to check our hearts and go, oh yeah, I was, yep, that was 100% Emily striving on her own, trying to make something good happen. Not allowing the, 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 the presence of God to move and do his thing. So where are you striving in your own strength, or sorry, what are you doing in your own strength? And the second question is, where are you striving and trying to earn your salvation, trying to earn God's favor, trying to earn his love. These are tricky places because I know for, for mature believers, for people who have who've been with the Lord a long time, you're like, I, don't, I know he loves me, I know my salvation is secure. But then sometimes when we step back from these areas and we allow God to speak to us, we will see places in our lives where we truly are still trying to work for his love, work for his favor. And so my, my challenge to you today is to enjoy the Sabbath rest of God and to do it under the banner of who he is. Do it under the banner of truth that he is the author and the finisher of your faith, that it is by his power alone that we exist and that we live, that we get to be invited into this beautiful work, into this beautiful kingdom but it does not rise and fall on our efforts. It rises and it falls on the power of God alone. I'm gonna pray for us now. 
Father God, we just thank you so much. We thank you that your presence is here among us, God. We thank you that your word uh, just gives us such an illumination and such open eyes to who you are and to what you have for us. And so, God, I pray that as we kind of wrestle through this idea of Sabbath rest and what it looks like for us and how we can live it out, God, I pray that you would, you would speak to each of our hearts individually in this place right now. Holy Spirit, would you highlight any areas where we are doing something in our own strength? Would you highlight any areas where we are striving and trying to earn something from you that you've already won, that you've already bought for us? And God, would you breathe on this group of women and as they, as they dive deeper into these practices, God, that, that help them just grow in love for you, I pray that you would, you would sanctify their efforts this week, God. I pray that you would just uh, have your way in their lives and in their quiet times and in their, in their groups even now, God. And I pray that you would just speak your truth. I pray that you would just be glorified and made known. In your name we pray, amen.